There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night roam free and things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country and there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for sticking with us for the second part of the show. Appreciate having you here with us in the darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. Make a quick mention again for those of you that are tuning in. If you go to our website at darknessradio.com and click on the Trips button, you'll be able to pull up information regarding all of our upcoming retreats that we're going to be doing. And we've got some really cool stuff that's going to be coming up. As a matter of fact, we've just added a, um extension, if you will, to the... Stanley event. Uh, we had such a good turnout of people that, have, that bought tickets. Once we sold out, we had so many people looking to buy tickets that we ended up extending the trip. So all of the celebrities, all of the speakers, all of the hosts are going to stay on at the Stanley Hotel April 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and we all go back the 4th. It's going to be an awesome opportunity for you to uh, come on out and talk to the, the experts, hear what's going on, check out one of the most haunted locations in the United States. Tim and I were out there in November Tim, that was crazy. What? Well over half the people had personal experiences. Oh, yeah, most definitely. They had uh, just a great time, um, you know, everything from chairs being flipped into the middle of the room, crazy EVPs. You've got uh, um, shadow things walking around the halls that weren't you and I. Uh, it was just a fun time. Uh-huh. And plus, it was just such a fun time, you know, hanging out with all the people. So we did extend that trip. If you want, you can go to darknessradio.com and click on the trips banner, or you can go to darknessevents.com. It'll take you right to the trip section of our website, and that way you can look up all the different trips. We're also, we added a trip to Eastern State Penitentiary. For those of you Ghost Hunter fans, you'll recognize that as the site of the Shadow Man capture that uh, has been so controversial from the TV show Ghost uh, Ghost Hunters. I almost said Ghost Whisperer. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're going to be out there doing that event. That'll be June 21st through the 24th, and that's out in Philadelphia at Eastern State Penitentiary. Joining us on that trip, man, do we have a hell of a lineup for that one. That's going to be great, too. We've got Jason, Grant, and Steve Gonzalez from the TV show Ghost Hunters. We also have Chris Fleming, the psychic sensitive from Dead Famous. Then we've got John Zaffis, the godfather of the paranormal, the hardest working man in the paranormal. Ah! That's right. Then we uh, have Adam Bly, the demonologist and psychologist who's become wildly popular at our events with his talks. And to top it off, we've got Professor Paranormal himself, Lloyd Auerbach, will be joining us on the event. He'll be doing a talk about the paranormal. It's called The uh, uh, Parapsychology for Ghost Hunters. This is the name of his talk. We've got Rosemary Ellen Guiley. We've got the author, Linda Zimmerman. We've got the guys from Terror Normal. That's right, the new paranormal show that's being worked on, Terror Normal. You can check that out by going to myspace.com backslash terror normal, all one word. Check out what's going on with those guys. They've got some exciting stuff going on, but they're going to be there to show their episode and do a Q&A with you there as well. We've got the hypnotist comedian Russ Clark will be out there having a great time. It's, it's a lot of fun, and we are going to go back to the Queen Mary. We're going to be doing that trip out in, um, it looks like the end of November, first weekend of December time, time frame. So the website's got all the information up there. I uh, hope you'll come out and join us. We had a fantastic time out there. As a matter of fact, we got some amazing photographs and EVP evidence and Chris Fleming while in the pool um, area where the little girl Jackie, the ghost, was, actually called out and uh, over 50 people ended up hearing her converse with Chris and singing. So, I mean, what better could you hope for on a paranormal trip than having wild paranormal experiences like that? So come on out, join us, have a good time, check our website for all that information. Now we're going to get into tonight's show. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, 
our guest that we have on is going to be joining us out at the Stanley on both the regular retreat and on the extension retreat. He was referred to us uh, actually by uh, our first guest this evening, Rosemary Ellen Guiley. And uh, we checked out his website, been on the phone. I'm a great guy. He's going to actually come out, talk to us, do a presentation for us at the Stanley. And he's got some really cool equipment he's going to be bringing along with him. Our guest this evening is Mark Macy, and he's an award-winning afterlife author and researcher in ITC, or Instrumental Transcommunication. Um, that's the use of technical equipment to get information from the worlds of spirit in the form of voices, images, and text. He's talked on the phone with departed colleagues, and uh, with the use of a subtle energy device called a luminator, he has photographed many clear spirit faces of late colleagues, loved ones, and celebrities, including John Denver. So, Tim, finally, you can communicate with John Denver. Excellent. Yes. So uh, the results that he does on these uh, research can actually be seen and heard on his websites at spiritfaces.com and www.worlditc.org. So, again, it's www.spiritfaces.com and www.worlditc.org and in his new book, Spirit Faces, Truth About the Afterlife. So we'd like to welcome to our show this evening Mr. Mark Macy. Good evening, Mark. Hi, Dave. Tim, it's really nice to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate having you on here with us this evening. And we really appreciate you joining us at the uh, Stanley event to to do the talk and share your information with us there. Yeah, uh, um, we don't live too far from Estes Park, but it's such a beautiful place. My wife and I actually had our honeymoon there some 25 years ago. It's a beautiful place where the Stanley Hotel is. And that's when you guys were like seven years old, right? I'd like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Stanley is a gorgeous place, and the surroundings are just breathtaking. Uh, and, boy, how about those elk? That's crazy, Mark. It's incredible, man. Those elk are gigantic. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit now. You've, you've got a book out. Let's let's talk about the book Spirit Faces, The Truth About the Afterlife. With this, now, this is the book. You use the Luminator to, to create and capture these, these photographs. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Now, I know on the cover of the book, I'm looking at it, it, it to me, and help me out so we understand exactly what we're looking at, because I know everybody's going to go check out the site. We see on here uh, a photograph of a woman with kind of a ghostly image of her face in front of it. Now, is that her her face, or is it supposed to be the face of a ghost of a loved one or relative that's floating in front of hers? Actually, that's kind of an unusual picture. Usually we get uh, just a person and with a spirit showing up over the person. In this particular case, Mimi is a really a beautiful young woman, and the two faces that showed up totally replaced hers. One is a young man, and one is her mother, kind of an older-looking woman. And uh, so, in that particular picture, both uh, both of the spirit faces kind of replaced her face altogether. Wow! Yeah, because that is a okay. Now that you're saying it, I can see it. If you're saying she's a younger woman, now I don't see the male image in there, but. My resolution is not the greatest on my computer screen, but there's a male face on there as well, you're claiming? Well, the the, the fellow who's looking out at um, to the left, uh, it, it looks, it's kind of a feminine-looking face, but it's, I've studied it pretty hard. It looks like a young man. Okay. The, the, the higher face, and the lower face is the older woman. Well, yeah, you can definitely see the older woman's face in there, but like I said, I didn't know because the hair looks so similar if it was just a motion that was going on. Now, the people are perfectly still when you take these photographs, right? Yes, and so is the camera. Now, explain to us, how are you getting, the, or is this something you can't get into too much? I'm sure you share about it in your book, but how are you getting the effects like this? Well, the Luminator you mentioned, it's a subtle energy device developed by a fellow in Michigan named Patrick Richards, and it uh, emits this energy field, subtle energy. People who are sensitive can kind of feel the bristling sensation when they're in the presence of the Luminator. And, uh, it somehow uh, creates sort of a matrix or something. I, I've heard it described in different ways, but it seems to melt away the barriers between the physical and the spiritual realm, so spirit can come in close and uh, draw upon the ectoplasm we have or the spiritual substances we have in our body, and they can develop a spirit body that's dense enough to show up on film. That's, in a nutshell, what it, how it works. Now, you're taking these with a Polaroid camera, that's correct? Correct, yeah. We just... Uh, th there's nothing changed with a Polaroid camera except that we cover the light, uh, the flash unit, so that it emits just a tiny flicker of light instead of full flash, because a full flash, any sort of uh, uh, intense lighting will wash away these effects. It has to be done in a dark lighting situation. Okay, now you're actually going to bring the Luminator with you 
to the event, correct? Yes. And you're going to make it available. You're going to, I think we talked, you're going to go really nice low price, only $5 if people want to get a picture taken with the Luminator and see if, if ghostly images appear around you, correct? Correct. All right. Well, that's awesome. I mean, that's a, boy, you can't even beat that price for 5 bucks. That's an amazing deal. Yeah. I say you screw them and charge them 15 bucks, Mark. Let's do that. No. We'll, we'll split it. You, me, and Tim will go out that night for beers, okay? No, five is okay. good. We, we <laughs> cover, cover the price of the film. That's good. <laughs> That's right. um, so now, how did you discover this, and what, what led you to believe that creating this machine would allow you to build this? Uh, it, it, to me, it almost sounds like you're making like a uh, like a movie screen that, that this light is projecting against to catch, capture these photographs. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, from the early 90s, I was involved in this field of research called ITC, which is getting in touch with the other side through TVs, radios, telephones, computers, and other equipment. And um, that's when I was talking on the phone with, our, with my spirit friends and other colleagues were getting contacts by computer. Well, one of my, uh, I was putting out a newsletter at that time, and one of the uh, subscribers suggested I... Uh, visit a fellow named Jack Stuckey, who lives in Colorado. He's a therapist, and he had a luminator, uh, a device that allowed him to take unusual pictures of people, and it also was used in his therapy practice. So I visited Jack, and I saw the, p- the pictures he was taking, and I, I recognized, I uh, identified him right away as spirit pictures. Um, and so I figured I needed to get one of these for my research. So I contacted the inventor in Michigan, and... Uh, purchased one and I've been using it ever since and it, it's, it doesn't provide real meaningful information from the other side like some aspects of ITC do but the beauty of the Illuminator is it provides really good solid evidence that our world is superimposed by the spirit worlds and they can show up in our lives and in our work uh, in meaningful ways. Well let me, let me ask you this now you said you started with uh, the ITC that was the way you began now I believe there was a special I saw, <clears throat> boy, and this was like in the 92, 93, maybe it was on like sightings or something like that, maybe you can help me out, where they were, there was a gentleman that was filming static on a TV screen, and then, uh, which I think they ended up using in white noise too, right, to create that like tunnel effect, and then they would see faces appear in that snow. Mm-hmm. Now, is that what you were involved with? Is that? Yes, that was me on the TV. I think it was... Uh... I was on the sightings mm-hmm. episode and uh, an old TV show called The Other Side that you might... The Other Side, oh, right, 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 okay. Now, with that episode, though, now, correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm sorry, I don't, don't, I'm trying to remember the information I looked at. Was it that you found this when you were experimenting with it and you had a, a loved one come through to you, a, a daughter or a relative like that? No, with, with the TV images, I was showing results from Europe at that time. Uh, as far to, to my knowledge, nobody in the States has received any really good clear spirit faces on TV at the, up to this point, but in Europe they were getting all sorts of really great images, so um, I was sharing those on TV at that time. Okay. How, how are they, you know, I mean, everybody automatically is going to say it's some kind of bleed through from another channel, uh-huh. but like, you know, if you look at the, if you go to your website at worlditc.org, you have some images there like Doc Muller, is it Doc Muller or Mueller? Mueller. Yeah. Mueller, okay, Doc Mueller where you've got the photograph of him and then you've got the image that appeared on the TV screen, which which is really kind of strange because it almost looks like an exact copy of that photograph. That happens quite a lot, we found. Uh, when they, well, the spirit body is kind of ma- malleable. It, uh, they can change their appearance and um, sometimes they come through looking old to us as, as they did in old age uh, because that's kind of what we're expecting. Right. And sometimes they'll very very often they'll come through in, a, uh, in, a, in an appearance that resembles something that they looked like on Earth. Like if George Washington was to come through, he'd probably look like he looks on a dollar bill because that's the way most people recognize him. And it's a combination, combination of their intention and our um, intention that creates the image we see. It's kind of it's hard to understand by earthly physics, but that's the way spirit world physics seems to work. It's you know, kind of a combined, the, the, the minds of the two or more entities kind of form this reality. Wow. I mean, that's that's crazy, the photographs that you're able to pull up on this. And I'm, I'm just flipping through some of the different pictures. Now, you actually have, was it the Luminator you used that you, you caught what you believe to be the face of John Denver? Yeah, it was. Uh, 
back in the 70s, uh, when I got out of the Navy, I, I, was, I was driving across country to visit my brother in New York, and Rocky Mountain High was on the radio all the time, you know, so it just lifted my spirits every time I heard it, you know, I felt like right. I was flying to New York, you know, yeah. so I've been, I kind of resonated with him ever since, uh, just um, the Colorado connection, you know, and so when he died, uh, a number of his friends and some of my colleagues, we were all hoping that he would start coming through, and so on that particular occasion, we, be- we believe he did. So who is the photograph that it's being taken over? Uh, this was a, uh, well, one of his friends was at that workshop, but this happened to be a picture of uh, Joy Schilling, a woman who owns a metaphysical bookstore in Colorado Springs. She didn't know him personally, but uh, there seemed to be a resonance, and that, that's the key to this work, is you re- we resonate with different people in spirit, and those are the ones who kind of work with us, whether it's through somebody like John Edwards or James Van Trog or an ITC researcher or just anybody. Uh, whoever we resonate with on the other side, they're there with us to support us. And um, there seemed to be some sort of inner resonance between this Joy Schilling and John Denver. They, se- they seem to have a lot of the same nature or personality, I guess. Okay. Now I see that you also can do this with computer faces have made their appearances on computer screens as well? Those are the most, uh, some of the most amazing contacts we've gotten, uh, mostly in Europe. There's a couple who would leave for work in the morning. They'd make sure that everything at home was turned off. And they'd get home in the evening after work, and sometimes there'd be a computer running, and there'll be new files planted on the disk. The files might contain text, or they might contain images, actual uh, letters and pictures from the other side describing in detail what life is like over there. And it's not just, you know, when you see these TV shows like Ghost Whisper or uh, Meet the Medium, mm-hmm. it, they, they talk about these individuals going to the light. Right. And that's where ITC is really focused. It's not the troubled souls who are stuck near the earth, the ghosts and the apparitions, but we're, we're opening communication bridges to the light, to this paradise world. Uh, where people get settled in and they just enjoy blissful lives and they decide, some of them decide they want to support people on Earth and they, they want to support these ITC projects. And so um, so let me, let me get this straight real quick just before we go too far on. So not only do faces appear, but emails or, or not, I don't want to say emails, but documents will appear on people's computers? Yes. From loved ones? Yes. Loved ones or it's actually the spirit group. It's more than just uh, one or two people on this side and one or, two, one or two people on that side. It's usually a team of people on this side working with a uh, dedicated spirit group who's working over a period of time with, with us and also with ethereal beings or higher beings to open up these communication channels. And that's when we start getting these more miraculous forms of uh, contacts. Unbelievable. Well, and you do. You have to see it to, to believe it yourself. And, you know, again, check out our website. We'll probably have a lot of people check it out during the show, and we get a lot of downloads of the show afterwards. But uh, worlditc.org is the website to go look at to see a lot of this. There's also a link there that will actually take you to the Spirit Faces location as well. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, good. So you can do that. You're, uh, you're listening to The Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. Our guest is Mark Macy. And uh, we will be back with more with Mark Macy and talking about Spirit Faces, um, the book that he has out, Truth About the Afterlife, and talk about ITC and a little bit more about the applications and how we can do these things and experiment with it at home. We'll be back with more right after this. Once you have seen Dave and Tim in the light, you'll understand why we must return to the darkness on the edge of town. Stay tuned. There is more to come. For 58 years, Fate has consistently supplied its loyal readership with a broad array of true reports of the strange and unknown. Fate is a factual magazine containing articles by experts in all walks of life, and by others just like you who have something dynamic, significant, and truthful to say. Keep up with the latest on angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, archaeological hotspots, alternative science, and much, much more. To receive your free Fate magazine, call now at one 800 728-2730, or visit our website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730, or www.fatemag.com. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. 
Are you tired of reading about what couple in Hollywood is breaking up or divorcing? Have you ever wondered where you can find the news that covers the subjects that you are really interested in? I would like to invite you to visit SupernaturalNews.com. Supernatural News uses the latest internet technology to search for the topics we know you will be interested in reading. News of the latest Bigfoot, UFO, or Loch Ness monster sightings. Read about the latest conspiracy theories and urban legends. Supernatural News, where belief and reality merge. Okay, each of you youngins take a gun, a beer, and some smoke. Throttle circuit breakers in. We have separation. Inboard and outboard, they're on. We're coming forward with the side stick. Dave. You bastard! Dave Schrader, paranormal host. A man barely alive. Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. We have the capability to make the world's first bionic paranormal host. Dave Schrader will be that man better than he was before. What is it that makes you set the dip dip shoot? Better, stronger, faster. Run, Lord, run! Run, Lord! Welcome back to The Darkness on the Edge of Town with Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis. Hey, good evening and welcome back to the show. Our guest this evening is Mark Macy, and he's an award-winning afterlife author and researcher in ITC, or Instrumental Transcommunication. It's the use of technical equipment to get information from the worlds of spirit in the form of voices, images, and text. Mark, before we went to the break, we were kind of talking about the different ways that ITC has been used with computers, TV screens, um, you know, the, the illuminator that you're using for photography. What, what do you find are the best ways for spirit communication audibly? Um telephone <laughs> i mean if if you have a spirit group that can come through telephone it's by far the clearest and most meaningful conversation you can imagine with the other side uh but unless you have that that uh, bridge built you know it's the most popular way is simply edt the use of a tape recorder just just that now how, how are you using a phone to communicate with the dead well um and what kind of calling plan are you on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you just use a regular telephone, and um, you don't call them, unfortunately. They, you have to kind of wait until they call you. And oh, that's phone, a story in my life, Mark. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the, the phone rings in a normal way, and then you, you answer it, and you just uh, have a conversation. It, it's pretty amazing. All right, so we've got, uh, yeah, see, that's, to me, that's just crazy. So are, are you putting out an intention? Are you picking up the phone and going, give me a call, I'm waiting, and hang up? I mean, how do you get this thing to get going? Because uh, I sit at home all day long working, and I don't get calls from the dead, Mark. I need to know how we can do this. Okay. Uh, we were told uh, back in the early 90s and even late 80s that uh, uh, the I ITC, that the miraculous kinds of contacts wouldn't happen on a big scale until team of researchers from different countries could work together. Uh, the other side is kind of fostering um, a, a project in which it becomes a world effort, not just a, an effort of a few individuals. So in 1995, we established this group called INIT, or the International Network for Instr Instrumental Transcommunication. It involved 13 researchers from different countries. And once we did that, miraculous things began to happen. Uh, that's when we started getting the really tremendous computer contacts in Europe, and I started getting a lot of phone calls. Different people would get TV and radio contacts, and uh, it seemed to come about as a result of the resonance of a group of people, which is not an easy thing to sustain over time. Being, being human, we have these egos and we have hormones, and they, they kind of um, undermine our efforts to sustain harmony over a period of time. But that's what we need for ITC contacts, is for these bridges to be built, it requires a certain harmony and trust among researchers over a period of time. And this is not easy 
to sustain, we found out. Now, how often were you getting phone calls, and how did you know they were from the dead? Was it a relative or a friend that you knew was gone? No, all the phone calls I got were from um, a researcher who had died. His name was Constantine Rodiv, and he was a pioneer in the EVP uh, before he died. Um, I have a, I had a uh, call, caller ID on the phone, but when I when they called, they just said out of area, which is kind of an understatement, you know. Right. <laughs> right. But uh, um, sometimes I would get a phone call, and then the same day or the next day, a colleague of mine in Europe, especially a fellow named Adolf Holmes, would receive a computer contact, uh, and it would say, this is Constantine Raudai, and I herewith confirm my contact with colleague Macy in the States by telephone. And so we would get cross contacts like that to uh, confirm to us that these were legitimate contacts. Um, but how do you know it wasn't just somebody quacking both of you? Well, the, the computer he used was an old Commodore 64. It had no internet connection. It was connected to nothing except the power out in the wall and the keyboard and the printer. So somebody would, somebody would have had to break into his home, you know, and plant the message. Uh, unless Adolf Holmes himself was pulling everybody's chain, but we know that's not the case. He was, his, his efforts were being closely uh, recorded by a physicist in Germany named uh, Ernst Sienkowski, who's a, probably the, the most highly regarded ITC researcher in the world. Um, so we just know from experience that this is for real, but for, for a skeptical outsider, it's natural to be, um, to have doubts, you know, unless it happens to them well, the first time, the first time you got a phone call, were you going, come on, who is this? Who is it really? No, because I've been working with, uh, I, had, I, have, I had colleagues in Europe at that time who were getting these tremendous contacts, and I'd seen enough evidence to know that they were for real. So when, um, when they happened to me, uh, I was about 95% certain that they were legitimate. And once we got the cross contacts, I was 100% convinced. Well, you know those crazy Germans. They might have been just pulling your leg. Okay, Franz, you call up Mark. Tell him that you're constant. It's going to be hilarious. <laughs> He's going to love this thing. Go ahead. Do it. Do it. <laughs> boo. <laughs> a boo, yeah, no, Mark. A, I'm a ghost. How are you? <laughs> that's a good point. You know, he had a, a northern European accent. Right. And uh, some of my colleagues had, this, had a similar accent. So based on that, a lot of my skeptical colleagues here in the state, States um, accused Accused us of being, accused them of uh, doing a hoax, you know. But we well, know from the well. Now, do you have? We there should be since he was a, a pioneer in EVP. There's got to be audio of his voice. Yeah. Right. And have you ever compared audio of his voice to the audio that you recorded? I mean, is it a pretty dead-on match? So to speak. <laughs> uh, very good. <laughs> and if um, so, where was Rich Little at the time? That's all yeah. I want. <laughs> yeah. Well, his secretary. Uh, Obviously, knew him very closely, very intimately, you know. And, um, so when she heard the voices, she listened to him closely. Uh, all the, a lot of the repeat, a lot of the telephone and radio contacts that he's made since his passing, and she she knows for certain that it's him, just because of the personality and the voice together. Well, you know, if you're listening out there, Mr. Odive, we've got a couple open phone lines. We'd be happy to take your calls. Yeah, we would. So uh, feel free to give us a ring, and we're here for you. We're not going to give out the number, just, you know, so there's no trickery or tomfoolery going on. But uh, feel free to give us a call. I, that's, you know, now, I'm one of the ones that believe in the phone conversations uh, without too much thought, Mark. And the reason I do that is after my grandmother passed, <clears throat> she uh, not only made f uh, physical connection with me where she came back to visit me as a, as a child, but she also phoned my aunt on at least two occasions that I'm aware of. Um, and when my aunt, you know, heard this, now, of course, a lot of people think, oh, it's a dream or something, but when she screamed, my grandfather ran into the room and grabbed the phone and the other end of the line was dead. There wasn't that annoying eh, 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 noise. There was no dial tone, nothing. It was just a dead line, so to speak, if you will, again. But, um, you know, it's kind of interesting that Phone calls from the dead have actually occurred for, you know, as long as the phone has been around. That's true. Uh, the stories are amazing that, that kind of, uh, you know, have happened with, uh, there's a really good famous story, I don't, I don't mean to digress too much from your experiences, but uh, where the little girl <clears throat> of the housekeeper next to this woman, um, 
the, the housekeeper had become really ill. He'd hurt himself, and if he had hurt his back pretty bad, and I guess if he slept in a certain way, he could actually suffocate and die. And this little girl had died a few years before, and the woman was at home, and her phone rang, and the little girl's voice came on and said, you know, introduced herself and said uh, something like, my daddy needs your help. And she went over to the house, and sure enough, the, the father had fallen asleep in the wrong position, and there, you know, she was able to get him safely awake and, and uh, you know, keep him from becoming paralyzed or dying. So, I mean, that's like one of the more dramatic cases out there. But phone calls from the dead have been happening, you know, pretty much as long as phone calls have been, or phones have been in existence. Yep. Um, now, how many of the cases that you've dealt with or heard of, does there seem to be a certain amount of them that, you know, I mean, we've heard about the ones where it takes place instantaneously, you know, upon my co-host Tim dying, my phone rings, and it's Tim saying goodbye to me. And then, I, you know, I hang up the phone. I'm like, what the hell was that about? And then 10 minutes later, I get a call from the hospital that he died. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, that, that's that been a pretty popular one. Then there's, of course, the ones where you get the call prior to death and they're in a coma. You know, I mean, how, how often do you hear stories like that? Or have you collected those stories as well? I've heard quite a few. And, you know, these things happen a lot more than most of us would uh, believe, believe that they happen. They, they're, they're, they are pretty common, these uh, phone calls from the other side. It was uh, Lou Gentili, the uh, radio show host, too. He did a talk. He was saying that one of the, well, this woman was being haunted. They set up all their equipment in their house, in the house, and they left the house. And uh, they're all sitting at dinner. There's nobody there. And her house kept calling her cell phone. Hmm. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, she her phone would start ringing, and it was coming from inside the house. But, you know, I mean, there was no way for, there was nobody there. And they had video cameras covering every angle in the house. So, of course, they went back to see if anybody was screwing around in there, and there was nobody at the house. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, just the... There seems to be a case where um, I, I think Spirit has always tried to come through in any way they could, whether it was uh, crystal balls or cards or whatever, whatever the latest technology has been. Right. And now we have telephones and radios and computers, and so... They see this as a tremendous opportunity to start opening really meaningful channels to the other side. And so it's starting to happen on a pretty grand scale. Well, and it makes sense if spirits are nothing more than an energy form now, that manipulating energy should seem to be a little bit easier to do. And manipulating the energy to work a phone or come over you know, as a TV signal or something like that. Of course, now we live in the, the advent of cable and satellite. We don't have any blank TV channels to kind of stare at. You know, unless we, I guess we hook up our TV without any antenna to it. But, um. Yeah, a big part of it is transducing the energy uh, from the subtle energies of their world and, and their equipment. They have, actually have equipment on their side and um, trying to make them uh, inter interact with the dense energies that we have in this world, the electromagnetic range, you know. Right. Let me ask this. Now, your pictures that you do, the spirit faces, you always seem to take a picture in front of a person. Have you ever just taken a picture in a room and caught faces and, and things in the room with the illuminator going on? You know, I've tried a, on a number of occasions to do that, but um, it seems to require them to be right with the physical body and uh, take on some of this spiritual substance that we have in our bodies. Uh, that, that seems to be the only way it's, I've seen it work so far. So they're almost using us like a transmitting tower. Yes. Now, Tim, Tim's got a quick question for you here, Mark. Just a quick one, Mark. You, you had stated that uh, they have equipment on the other side. Uh -huh. uh, like what? Uh, they, whatever they used in their lifetime. They might have a, an old telephone or a radio. They have uh, the things that they have on their side, whether it's food or vehicles or uh, homes or buildings or forests, oceans, equipment, whatever. It's manufactured by thought, kind of a combination of their thought plus the it's facilitated by the more powerful thoughts of ethereal beings or higher beings who interact with their world. So that when, when they're communicating with us, they uh, it's not like they're transmitting from some distant location out in space, but all of these spirit worlds are superimposed over each other and over our world. Um, time and space are kind of illusions of our dimension. So when they contact us, they set up their equipment or they have their equipment right up Right, right in the lab with us, or in our home, or in, the, in your case, the studio, you know, and they make their equipment interact directly with ours in a way that we don't fully understand at this time. So then let me ask you this, Mark. If they have the equipment that they had when they crossed over to the other side, how could they make such a scientific breakthrough as to get to us on here on this side? Because technically, if you have the same equipment as you had, like, say, if you passed away in 1920, you know, even though you may have advanced knowledge on the other side, you don't necessarily have the tools. You'd have to invent something, wouldn't you? 
Well, yeah, you see, but it's it's really a spirit group that involves people from many uh, eras. So you have not just the Edisons and the, um, the people from the turn of the century, 20th century, but you also have people who are, who are dying nowadays, and they're familiar with computers and uh, modern technologies. And you even have people from the future, apparently, who have futuristic technologies. And so you have all these things working together on the other side. Well, but, wasn't it Doc Mueller that was coming through and helping to build, was it Spiritcom? Was that what he was helping build? Yeah, the Spiritcom device. That, right, now he was he was somebody that had been dead. Now, is he, let, help me remember, now Doc Mueller, was he the, um, was he in NASA, not with NASA, was it NASA? Well, you know, that was a confusion. Uh, we still have it on our website, but it turns out there was another Doc, another George Mueller who worked with NASA, but this George Mueller was a, a, a university professor. I, I'm not sure which university yet, but I, I haven't done all the research yet, but he was, um, well, didn't the the theory or the story go that he was coming back and helping them build Spiritcom, but in order to prove who he was, he told them where his death certificate was or his something or other that I thought they were able to actually track and realize that this yes. guy wasn't just a kook. Yeah, but he gave him all sorts of personal information, unlisted phone numbers, uh, social security number, the, uh, almost like a resume, a detailed resume about his life. And they checked up on most of that information and found out that it checked out. But I thought that that was, he was giving like high-ranking official numbers at, the, at NASA and at the, the government level. How well, would a professor have that? There was some confusion in some, some people's research. He, he didn't actually say something about NASA. I think that was gathered independently by a researcher who made a mistake. Oh, okay. Originally. So, but the information he did, he did give us was legitimate. Right, but now he came through and actually said, okay, this is how you build this. You need to put this here and that there, right? So if yeah, time is not linear in the ether world, he might have been able to see how it was built by, um, because he's already seen it built in the future. Is that right? Is that what you're assuming? And that if whatever he thinks he can create on the other side so he can make the communication to us through our current or, or rudimentary equipment, is that right? Yes, that, okay. that's, that's pretty close, yeah. All right. Now... So what are your thoughts on are we actually speaking to a spirit world or are we talking to alternate dimensions? Uh, it's the same thing, basically. I think uh, spirit worlds are basically other dimensions. They're, they're finer realms of existence. Like radio signals are all distinguished by their frequency, even though they're all jumbled together, you know. Uh, the spirit worlds also are d d distinguished by their vibration. It's a spiritual vibration rather than a radio frequency. But... Um, it's like a vibration of life, I guess. And uh, all these worlds remain distinct by this vibration. Okay, so I, I, get, I, I get that. I kind of get it. Let me say this. So I don't know if I um, am on the same page as you, though. So when we die, I mean, in your belief, is there a heaven and hell? Are we going to different places like that? And some of them just continue on in our realm in just a slightly different shade of reality? Or do we graduate from this reality to another reality? Uh, the way, I, the best way to explain it is that when we're alive on Earth, we establish these patterns of thought, patterns of behavior, and it's these patterns that kind of uh, act as a homing signal to take us to a certain vibration level after we die. It's a totally different world, but it's very similar to this world. A lot of the same structures, but if we're, uh, it, our, our mind is kind of like a radio tuner. If we're tuned into love and trust and goodwill and decency we have a good feeling about people, we establish a fine spiritual vibration in our spirit body while we're still alive, so that when we lose the physical body, that spiritual body continues to exist at a fine level of existence in this, these paradise worlds, what they call beyond the light, you know, when people go into the light. Mm -hmm. But if, if our thoughts on earth are kind of uh, trapped in doubts and fears and animosities and resentments toward people, then we establish kind of a dense vibration for our spirit body, and in this case, we lose our physical body and we move to these rather dense spiritual realms uh, close to the earth, like you see people who are stuck in Ghost Whisperer, or the medium. And uh, y y people stay there for a little while and they eventually move on to paradise where they belong, but they have to process this kind of troubled thinking for a while. So that's basically the heaven and hell legend as it really is. Okay. I, I'm curious, too, as I'm overlooking your site here at uh, worlditc.org, do the faces that have appeared on TVs and computer screens, are they ever animated? Do they move at all, or is it usually just a stagnant, like a snapshot? 
Uh, the TV, the TV images. TV or the computer screen images, anything like that. Okay, the computer screen images come across as like TIFF files or JPG files, so they're okay. just static pictures. But the t TV images, some of them have come through actual motion pictures, moving pictures of landscapes or people talking. You can see their lips moving. Okay, so you could actually see them actively doing something. It wasn't just a an image zapped on the screen. Uh, it's yeah, we've gotten both kinds of pictures on the TV, All static right. and moving. Have, now, have these spirits come forth and told you guys anything earth-shattering that uh, you haven't, you're not allowed to release at this point? Uh, they've told us a lot of mind-boggling, earth-shaking things, that, but we've not been told. We've not been restricted. They said that everything they've told us we could share. So I've shared a lot of that in, that in the book. For example, they talked about. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't, why don't we do this? We have to take a quick break. We'll leave yeah. people kind of hanging here for a second. Okay. When we come back, let's hear some of these earth-shattering thoughts and, and share a little bit more about the book. You're listening to Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. Our guest is author Mark Macy, and we're here talking about his book, Spirit Faces, Truth About the Afterlife, in his worlditc.org website. Again, we'll be back right after this. Don't you dare move. There's more to come from the darkness on the edge of town with Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis. If you, if you read, read Taps, Taps Paramag every month, month you'll, you'll be, be able, able to tell the difference between the absurd and the creepy. <laughs> Taps Paramag takes you where few would ever go on purpose. <laughs> From exclusive interviews with the cast of The Ghost Hunters to the latest trends in technology in the field of the paranormal. To join our journey, order at Taps Paramag. Com. Are you tired of reading about what couple in Hollywood is breaking up or divorcing? Have you ever wondered where you can find the news that covers the subjects that you are really interested in? I would like to invite you to visit SupernaturalNews.com. Supernatural News uses the latest internet technology to search for the topics we know you will be interested in reading. News of the latest Bigfoot, UFO, or Loch Ness monster sightings. Read about the latest conspiracy theories and urban legends. Supernatural News, where belief and reality merge. You hear footsteps and things bumping and banging in the middle of the night. Could it be paranormal activity? Or is it just Dave and Tim raiding your fridge? Mmm, beer. Strange things happen in the darkness on the edge of town. Seems like a lot of strange things happen in the world of Mark Macy, too. We've got spirit faces popping up on his Polaroid, can on his Polaroid pictures. You've got uh, faces showing up on TV screens. JPEGs and TIFF files popping up on computers with uh, with uh, stories of the afterlife. Uh, it's an amazing life you're leading, Mark. Do you ever just sit back and think, am I going nuts? Well, I did at first. Uh, but I've kind of reconciled it all, and I. it's pretty pretty fun. It's a lot of fun, this life. Let's talk a little bit about the secrets of the universe. Okay. You said they've given you some of these mind-blowing things that have happened, you know, or, or are going to happen, can you share a couple of those with us and yeah. a little bit of the thoughts of the people involved that heard this? This is the story, of, this is the story told to us by a group of ethereal beings who say they've followed our, followed our world and supported us for tens of thousands of years. So uh, by the time they told us this story, I developed kind of an implicit trust in the things they said, but this, this was such a mind-boggling thing, it took me about a year to reconcile it. They said that there used to be a planet between Mars and Jupiter uh, called Marduk, or is also called Eden, and uh, it was inhabited by this highly advanced human species. It was a paradise world, and they had mastered space travel, so they colonized the Earth and probably some other planets as well. They didn't tell us, but for, certainly the Earth. They were studying the primitive hominids here on planet Earth at the time. Meanwhile, the technologies back on their home planet, um, Marduk, or, or Eden, got out of hand and they destroyed their planet. It blew up. And uh, so the asteroids rained down on the planets, like on the Earth, and caused havoc here and on other planets. And it resulted in kind of the asteroid belt that now exists between Mars and Jupiter in this extra-large orbit that uh, circles our sun. And um, so the people who are <clears throat> these advanced beings who are um, stranded here on Earth, they set about establishing colonies here on Earth, uh, and uh, they still had some of the advanced technologies left over from their home planet. But this world here on Earth was so rugged and primitive and harsh. I mean, 
animals, really deadly animals, killing each other for food. And it was just a difficult place to live. And so they found it kind of an inhospitable climate, so they decided to crossbreed with the primitive hominids who were existing on Earth at that time, probably the Neanderthals. They didn't give us a name exactly, but that's my take on it. And uh, so it was this crossbreeding that led to not only the legends like the fall of grace of man from the Garden of Eden, but also led to modern humans. We're the product of this crossbreeding between these highly advanced beings from this planet Eden that existed between Mars and Jupiter and the primitive hominids of Earth. And so that's why kind of today we, we're kind of like a sp- schizophrenic species. You know, we rally for peace one day and then we uh, wage war the next day. You know, we have these this very mixed heritage. Right. Well, that's uh, that's pretty uh, pretty amazing. Now, have they found any proof that there may have been planets between our planets in the solar system yet? Well, that's one that's been one theory for quite a few years that the the asteroid belt that exists between Mars and Jupiter uh, there's no explanation to why that exists but one uh, other than a planet that, that exploded okay how about um, what would give us another mind-blowing thought that was going on well let's see they said that um, anything cool like peanut butter cures cancer <laughs> you know, or listen to darkness radio it rules anything you know really mind-blowing like that nothing uh, I can't think of anything like that often okay <laughs> um, um, well, how about yeah? What else otherwise do you have as as some of the other things? Well, they, that came they up? talked about they they went ahead and said that uh, the civilization of Atlantis uh, developed out of um, these ancient technologies, and uh, but they went ahead, they they went ahead and blew up Atlantis too. I guess they caused that to sink. They told us the timeline of that. It happened about twelve twenty B.C. I guess I believe that's when they said it was. Um, and the King's Island of Atlantis was located about a little bit east of the current island of Helgoland off of the North German and Danish coast. So it wasn't in the South Pacific as we sometimes, or South Atlantic, it was actually up north, uh, around north, northern Germany, I guess. That's where the King's Island of Atlantis was. Okay, so they gave you that. Now, have they done any dives or any research to try to correlate with that finding? There have been some uh, ancient walls and structures found in that area, yeah. Now, did that happen after you guys found out about this, or was it before? Uh, I don't know. I think it was probably before, but I think if they did some diving in that specific spot that I mentioned, I think they'd find a lot of interesting things. Well, have you talked to anybody that, I mean, there's constant things going on with uh, searching for Atlantis. As a matter of fact, I just watched a show, I think, on Discovery or History Channel called uh, Seeking Atlantis about Mm -hmm. a week ago. Yeah. And they're looking for people that claim to believe. Now, one of the interesting things was off the Greek Isles, uh, this one gentleman believes that he has found the ruins. And um, he says nobody's checked it out yet. And they were, you know, very skeptical of it. He said he would take them out there, but that they couldn't tell where it was. And he took them out there, and sure as hell, they found these huge uh, tiles, like uh, ceiling tiles, or not ceiling tiles, but roofing tiles, like the clay roofing tiles. They found uh, pillars, they found shapes, formations possibly steps going up and down in this location. So, I mean, they're, they're certainly interested in looking into this kind of stuff. Have you guys thought of bringing it out to scientific um, discovery channels or things like that that may be willing to do an expedition on the information that you guys were given? Uh, all, in, all in good time, I guess. Uh, everybody, a lot, a lot of people have theories about where Atlantis is. and um, everybody, Everybody's in, interested in exploring in their own way at their own pace, you know. So it'll come out eventually, and uh, I've made it public in books, and I've got an article coming out in Venture Inward magazine about it. So. That's right. You do have a. It was. An, is there an article that you just did about uh, Atlantis, or is it a book that you did? I, I apologize again. I oh, it, the, the book Spirit Faces has a chapter on on, the, on Atlantis and Eden and Marduk and all that. Okay. Then I have a, an article that will come out sometime this year in Venture Inward, the Edgar Casey magazine. Oh right, all right. And Rosemary Guiley wrote an article about the work in. Uh, Atlantis in Atlantis Rising, I guess. Oh, right, that's what it was. I'd read that, and that was is that for Fate Magazine? Is that or that, that that also? She wrote one for Fate Magazine, also. Okay, all right, that's that's where I recognize. I thought there was so, an article I'd read on it. Right. <laughs> so we're trying hard to get the word out, but it just takes time, you know. All right, let's let's 
end the show a little bit. Now, for people that want to start experimenting with these things at home, would you recommend that? Or do you think that you're opening up portals to dangerous places at all? Well, it's like any uh, any medium to open up, whether it's a Ouija board or crystal ball or uh, electronic equipment. It, 99%, well, 95%, I, th- I think, is your attitude. If you have the right attitude, if you uh, have a lot of enthusiasm and inspiration about the other side, and there are people on the other side you absolutely love who have died, you know, I think it's a great thing to experiment in any way you can. But if you're full of trepidation and fear about uh, what you might run into, like monsters and ghosts and spooks, you know, it's better to wait until you can reconcile that and uh, develop a comfortable feeling about the about the afterlife and then start experimenting. Well, you know, with that said, have you and all the experiments that you guys have done and have heard, have they ever gotten creepy, demonic-looking faces or things that didn't look friendly or possibly even alien faces popping up on the screen. Yeah. Uh, during the uh, period of about five or six years when our uh, international group was really harmonious and everything was really good, we, we all just had a we total, we were complete friends and really close friends with everybody in different countries. We were getting nothing but wonderful contacts on the other side. But then uh, some egos and personalities began to take over and cause friction and conflicts with group. And at that time, we started getting some negative spirits breaking through our telephone calls and things and uh, giving us uh, unsettling messages, trying to stir up our lives rather than support us. So, like I said, it all depends on your attitude. As long as you have a good attitude, you develop, you have good contacts, but if, if uh, the darker aspects of human nature, the, the lower aspects, you know, the, the hatred and the fear and that kind of stuff, starts taking over, then it opens up the channels to negative spirits. Well, you know, the, the experts believe, and especially the exorcism, exorcisms, <laughs> the exorcists and uh, demonologists believe that when you open up a conduit like this, that a lot of times they'll come through first as helpful spirits, uh, meaning to bring you help and, and, you know, do all this stuff, and then it turns out that they're not so much, you know, it's more of an evil or malevolent spirit or demonic that's doing these type of things. I mean, have you had any... Do you, I understand you're coming from a place of light, but even the light can be tricked. Have you ever thought, you know, I, I'm wondering what these messages are really about. Are they screwing with us? Are they trying to set us up for a fall? Are they trying to use us? I mean, are you, you know, I mean, it's like a science fiction fantasy here. They're helping you build machines to make communications. Have they ever told you guys how to build a machine that you thought, what if we're inviting whatever the hell's out there onto our planet through this conduit we're about to connect? Um. After my 15 years of research, I'm absolutely convinced that uh, if, if people can work together in harmony, you open up channels to this paradise world, and you get fantastic, wonderful beings working with you. And if you, uh, if you're, if it breaks down into conflicts here on Earth, then that opens up, the, it creates dissonance, and it breaks down the channel that these higher beings can work with us. So negative channels, negative spirits can break in. But I think it's it's mostly our own attitudes that allow that opening to happen. But Our arrogance and vanity follow all of us, and, and on an amazing experiment like this and, and getting the, yielding the results you guys were getting, isn't that going to be hard to do to find a group that will be united for that long and share these things to keep the communication open without somebody losing their mind doing this? Yes, and that's exactly why ITC right now is at a kind of a hibernation stage. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a project that's being directed and guided by the other side, and uh, we can only seem, seem to open up the channels as much as they'll let us, and until we can. Well, are you looking for new people to plug in, new new faces to start? And what what do you need? Does it have? Do you have to have a scientific background? Could it be, you know, say a radio DJ, a guy that works the fry cook machine at McDonald's, and and yourself? That, yes, that could, could come be. together. <laughs> I, I'm sure it could be any of those people. That's uh, it. We're making our own super friends, man. We're going to do this. Yeah, that'd be great. I've, you know, I've tried two other groups since then, and they've, all, they've both kind of fallen apart for the same reason. Um, it's Are, just difficult to sustain this harmony, but uh, it can be done. I know it can be done, and it's got to be the right people. Well, you know, we've spoken to a lot of people in the field that are very uh, tight in this field that really want to make leaps and bounds and changes, and they're all very humble people, very, uh, you know, behind-the-scenes working people that don't need the limelight. How can they get in touch with you if they're listening how can they get in touch with you to try to make themselves available to you to make these communications? I can be contacted through either website, spiritfaces.com or worlditc.org. All right, and then just 
again, I mean, I, you know, I said, could it be just anybody? But what could I bring to the table to be a part of this event with you? I mean, I'm not asking to do it, but I'm, I'm just saying, you know, just as a regular guy who has a radio show, what, what all would I offer to you? Um, all, all it would take on, on part of anyone is just uh, goodwill, basically, goodwill. Okay. That's it. And being able to sustain that goodwill over time. And so I don't have keeping, to be technically the ego mi- and the hormones in check. You know, that's that's a big thing. I don't have to be technically minded to know how to build the things no. they tell me to build, or or to do the things that they want us to do. Technology, I think, is less than five percent of this. It's, I think ninety-five percent plus is the attitude and the willingness to um, to work together on a, a um, putting the ego in check. You know. All right. Well, Mark, I, I can't thank you enough for the time you've spent with us tonight. I mean, it's fascinating, the topics. And, again, people, I, I suggest you check out his, his website, worlditc.org and spiritfaces.com. Check out those uh, two, two sites. And, again, if you go to worlditc.org, there's a link to his other site there. You can contact Mark. Um, well, I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, we look forward to seeing know. you out at the Stanley and, and, and being a part of this and seeing these experiments ourselves. Yeah, me, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that also. You know, talking to you is kind of like talking to a friend. I think that's why you have such a good radio show. And that's why uh, it's just enjoyable to be here, you know. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate yeah. hearing that. And, uh, you know, we'd love to have you on the show again, and maybe we'll talk to you after the Stanley event. We can talk about the cool things that we had happen there. Sounds good, Dave. Great. Well, thank you very much, Mark, and thank you, everybody, for tuning into the Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show this evening. We appreciate you spending your Super Bowl Sunday with us here this evening and uh, sharing every Sunday with us. Again, remember, we're here live every Sunday from 10 to midnight Central Time. We also invite you to check out our website at darknessradio.com. Click the Discuss button and join our bulletin board. Share your thoughts and ideas with other like-minded paranormal professionals. And also, you can join us in our live chat room every Sunday night during the show as well. Just go to darknessradio.com, click on the Listen tab, and click on the live chat. Thanks again. We'll be back again next week with a whole new show. I appreciate the time you spent with us, and we'll talk to you again real soon.